Section 8 of Psychopathology of Everyday Life. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Psychopathology of Everyday Life by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Read by Mary Schneider. Chapter 8 Erroneously Carried Out Actions. I shall give another passage from the above mentioned work of Meringer and Meyer. Quote, lapses in speech do not stand entirely alone. They resemble the errors which often occur in our other activities and are quite foolishly termed forgetfulness. End quote. I am therefore in no way the first to presume that there is a sense and purpose behind the slight functional disturbances of the daily life of healthy people. If the lapse in speech, which is without doubt a motor function, admits of such a conception, it is quite natural to transfer to the lapses of our other motor functions the same expectation. I have here formed two groups of cases, all of these cases in which the faulty effect seems to be the essential element, that is, the deviation from the intention, I denote as erroneously carried out actions. The others, in which the entire action appears rather inexpedient, I call symptomatic and chance actions. But no distinct line of demarcation can be formed. Indeed, we are forced to conclude that all divisions used in this treatise are of only descriptive significance and contradict the inner unity of the sphere of manifestation. The psychologic understanding of erroneous actions apparently gains little in clearness when we place it under the head of ataxia and especially under cortical ataxia. Let us rather try to trace the individual examples to their proper determinants. To do this I shall again resort to personal observations, the opportunities for which I could not very frequently find in myself. A. In former years, when I made more calls at the homes of patients than I do at present, it often happened when I stood before a door where I should have knocked or rung the bell that I would pull the key of my own house from my pocket, only to replace it quite abashed. When I investigated in what patients' homes that occurred, I had to admit that the faulty action, taking out my key instead of ringing the bell, signified paying a certain tribute to the house where the error occurred. It was equivalent to the thought, here I feel at home, as it happened only where I possessed the patient's regard. Naturally, I never rang my own doorbell. The faulty action was therefore a symbolic representation of a definite thought which was not accepted consciously as serious, for in reality the neurologist is well aware that the patient seeks him only so long as he expects to be benefited by him, and that his own excessively warm interest for his patient is evinced only as a means of psychic treatment an almost identical repetition of my experience is described by a mater several lines in french follow end quote. jones speaks as follows about the use of keys the use of keys is a fertile source of occurrences of this kind of which two examples may be given if i am disturbed in the midst of some engrossing work at home by having to go to the hospital to carry out some routine work i am very apt to find myself trying to open the door of my laboratory there with the key of my desk at home although the two keys are quite unlike each other the mistake unconsciously demonstrates where i would rather be at the moment some years ago I was acting in a subordinate position at a certain institution, the front door of which was kept locked, so that it was necessary to ring for admission. On several occasions I found myself making serious attempts to open the door with my house key. Each one of the permanent visiting staff, of which I aspired to be a member, was provided with a key to avoid the trouble of having to wait at the door my mistake thus expressed the desire to be on a similar footing and to be quite at home there a similar experience is reported by dr hans sox of vienna i always carry two keys with me one for the door of my office and one for my residence they are not by any means easily interchanged as the office key is at least three times as big as my house key Besides, I carry the first in my trouser pocket and the other in my vest pocket. 
yet it often happened that i noticed in reaching the door that while ascending the stairs i had taken out the wrong key i decided to undertake a statistical examination as i was daily in about the same emotional state when i stood before both doors i thought that the interchanging of the two keys must show a regular tendency if they were differently determined physically observation of later occurrences showed that i regularly took out my house key before the office door only on one occasion was this reversed i came home tired knowing that i would find there a guest i made an attempt to unlock the door with the naturally too big office key b at a certain time twice a day for six years i was accustomed to wait for admission before a door in the second story of the same house and during this long period of time it happened twice within a short interval that i climbed a story higher on the first of these occasions i was in an ambitious daydream which allowed me to mount always higher and higher in fact at that time i heard the door in question open as i put my foot on the first step of the third floor on the other occasion i again went too far engrossed in thought as soon as i became aware of it i turned back and sought to snatch the dominating fantasy i found that i was irritated over a criticism of my works in which the reproach was made that i always went too far which i replaced by the less respectful expression climbed too high c for many years a reflex hammer and a tuning fork lay side by side on my desk one day i hurried off at the close of my office hours as i wished to catch a certain train and despite broad daylight put the tuning fork in my coat pocket in place of the reflex hammer my attention was called to the mistake through the weight of the object drawing down my pocket any one accustomed to reflect on such slight occurrences would without hesitation explain the faulty action by the hurry of the moment and excuse it in spite of that i preferred to ask myself why i took the tuning fork instead of the hammer the haste could just as well have been a motive for carrying out the action properly in order not to waste time over the correction who last grasped the tuning fork was the question which immediately flashed through my mind it happened that only a few days ago an idiotic child whose attention to sensory impressions i was testing had been so fascinated by the tuning fork that i found it difficult to tear it away from him could it mean therefore that i was an idiot to be sure so it would seem as the next thought which associated itself with the hammer was hammer hebrew for ass but what was the meaning of this abusive language we must here inquire into the situation i hurried to a consultation at a place on the western railroad to see a patient who according to the anamnesis which i received by letter had fallen from a balcony some months before and since then had been unable to walk the physician who invited me wrote that he was still unable to say whether he was dealing with a spinal injury or traumatic neurosis hysteria that was what i was to decide this could therefore be a reason to be particularly careful in this delicate differential diagnosis as it is my colleagues think that hysteria is diagnosed far too carelessly where more serious matters are concerned but the abuse is not yet justified yes the next association was that the small railroad station is the same place in which some years previous i saw a young man who after a certain emotional experience could not walk properly at that time i diagnosed his malady as hysteria and later put him under psychic treatment but it afterward turned out that my diagnosis was neither incorrect nor correct a large number of the patient's symptoms were hysterical and they promptly disappeared in the course of treatment but back of these there was a visible remnant that could not be reached by therapy and could be referred only to multiple sclerosis those who saw the patient after me had no difficulty in recognizing the organic affliction i could scarcely have acted or judged differently still the impression was that of a serious mistake the promise of a cure which i had given him could naturally not be kept 
the mistake in grasping the tuning fork instead of the hammer could therefore be translated into the following words you fool you ass get yourself together this time and be careful not to diagnose again a case of hysteria where there is an incurable disease as you did in this place years ago in the case of the poor man and fortunately for this little analysis even if unfortunately for my mood this same man now having a very spastic gait had been to my office a few days before one day after the examination of the idiotic child we observe that this time it is the voice of self-criticism which makes itself perceptible through the mistake in grasping the erroneously carried out action is specially suited to express self-reproach the present mistake attempts to represent the mistake which was committed elsewhere d it is quite obvious that grasping the wrong thing may also serve a whole series of other obscure purposes here is a first example it is very seldom that i break anything i am not particularly dexterous but by virtue of the anatomic integrity of my nervous and muscular apparatus there are apparently no grounds in me for such awkward movements with undesirable results i can recall no object in my home the counterpart of which i have ever broken owing to the narrowness of my study it has often been necessary for me to work in the most uncomfortable position among my numerous antique clay and stone objects of which i have a small collection so much is this true that onlookers have expressed fear lest i topple down something and shatter it but it never happened then why did i brush to the floor the cover of my simple inkwell so that it broke into pieces my inkstand is made of a flat piece of marble which is hollowed out for the reception of the glass inkwell the inkwell has a marble cover with a knob of the same stone a circle of bronze statuettes with small terracotta figures is set behind this inkstand i seated myself at the desk to write i made a remarkably awkward outward movement with the hand holding the penholder and so swept the cover of the inkstand which already lay on the desk to the floor it is not difficult to find the explanation some hours before my sister had been in the room to look at some of my new acquisitions she found them very pretty and then remarked now the desk really looks very well only the inkstand does not match you must get a prettier one i accompanied my sister out and did not return for several hours but then as it seems i performed the execution of the condemned inkstand did i perhaps conclude from my sister's words that she intended to present me with a prettier inkstand on the next festive occasion and did i shatter the unsightly old one in order to force her to carry out her signified intention if that be so then my swinging motion was only apparently awkward in reality it was most skilful and designed as it understood how to avoid all the valuable objects located near it i actually believe that we must accept this explanation for a whole series of seemingly accidental awkward movements it is true that on the surface these seem to show something violent and irregular similar to spastic ataxic movements but on examination they seem to be dominated by some intention and they accomplish their aim with a certainty that cannot be generally credited to conscious arbitrary motions in both characteristics the force as well as the sure aim they show besides a resemblance to the motor manifestations of the hysterical neurosis and in part also to the motor accomplishments of somnambulism which here as well as there point to the same unfamiliar modification of the functions of innervation in latter years since i have been collecting such observations it has happened several times that i have shattered and broken objects of some value but the examination of these cases convinced me that it was never the result of accident or of my unintentional awkwardness thus one morning while in my bathrobe and straw slippers i followed a sudden impulse as i passed a room and hurled a slipper from my foot against the wall so that it brought down a beautiful little marble venus from its bracket as it fell to pieces i recited quite unmoved the following verse from bush ach de venus ist perdue 
clicker adams von medici this crazy action and my calmness at the sight of the damage is explained in the then existing situation we had a very sick person in the family of whose recovery i had personally despaired that morning i had been informed that there was a great improvement i know that i had said to myself after all she will live my attack of destructive madness served therefore as the expression of a grateful feeling toward fate and afforded me the opportunity of performing an act of sacrifice just as if i had vowed if she gets well i will give this or that as a sacrifice that i chose the venus of medici as this sacrifice was only gallant homage to the convalescent but even to-day it is still incomprehensible to me that i decided so quickly aimed so accurately and struck no other object in close proximity another breaking in which i utilized a penholder falling from my hand also signified a sacrifice but this time it was a pious offering to avert some evil i had once allowed myself to reproach a true and worthy friend for no other reason than certain manifestations which i interpreted from his unconscious activity he took it amiss and wrote me a letter in which he bade me not to treat my friends by psychoanalysis i had to admit that he was right and appeased him with my answer while writing this letter i had before me my latest acquisition a small handsome glazed egyptian figure i broke it in the manner mentioned and then immediately knew that i had caused this mischief to avert a greater one luckily both the friendship and the figure could be so cemented that the break would not be noticed a third case of breaking had a less serious connection it was only a disguised execution to use an expression from vischer's och einer of an object that no longer suited my taste for quite a while i had carried a cane with a silver handle through no fault of mine the silver plate was once damaged and poorly repaired soon after the cane was returned i mirthfully used the handle to angle for the leg of one of my children in that way it naturally broke and i got rid of it the indifference with which we accept the resulting damage in all these cases may certainly be taken as evidence for the existence of an unconscious purpose in their execution e as can sometimes be demonstrated by analysis the dropping of objects or the overturning and breaking of the same are very frequently utilized as the expression of unconscious streams of thought but more often they serve to represent the superstitious or odd significances connected therewith in popular sayings the meanings attached to the spilling of salt the overturning of a wine-glass the sticking of a knife dropped to the floor and so on are well known i shall discuss later the right to investigate such superstitious interpretations here i shall simply observe that the individual awkward acts do not by any means always have the same meaning but depending on the circumstances they serve to represent now this or that purpose recently we passed through a period in my house during which an unusual number of glass and china dishes were broken i myself largely contributed to this damage this little endemic was readily explained by the fact that it preceded the public betrothal of my eldest daughter on such festivities it is customary to break some dishes and utter at the same time some felicitating expression this custom may signify a sacrifice or express any other symbolic sense when servants destroy fragile objects through dropping them we certainly do not think in the first place of a psychologic motive for it still some obscure motives are not improbable even here nothing lies farther from the uneducated than the appreciation of art and works of art our servants are dominated by a foolish hostility against these productions especially when the objects whose worth they do not realize become a source of a great deal of work for them on the other hand persons of the same education and origin employed in scientific institutions often distinguish themselves by great dexterity and reliability in the handling of delicate objects as soon as they begin to identify themselves with their masters and consider themselves an essential part of the staff 
i shall here add the report of a young mechanical engineer which gives some insight into the mechanism of damaging things Quote, some time ago i worked with many others in the laboratory of the high school on a series of complicated experiments on the subject of elasticity it was a work that we undertook of our own volition but it turned out that it took up more of our time than we expected one day while going to the laboratory with f he complained of losing so much time especially on this day when he had so many other things to do at home i could only agree with him and he added half jokingly alluding to an incident in the previous week let us hope that the machine will refuse to work so that we can interrupt the experiment and go home earlier in arranging the work it happened that f was assigned to the regulation of the pressure valve that is it was his duty to carefully open the valve and let the fluid under pressure flow from the accumulator into the cylinder of the hydraulic press the leader of the experiment stood at the manometer and called a loud stop when the maximum pressure was reached at this command f grasped the valve and turned it with all his force to the left all valves without any exception are closed to the right this caused a sudden full pressure in the accumulator of the press and as there was no outlet the connecting pipe burst this was quite a trifling accident to the machine but enough to force us to stop our work for the day and go home it is characteristic moreover that some time later on discussing this occurrence my friend f could not recall the remark that i positively remember his having made similarly to fall to make a misstep or to slip need not always be interpreted as an entirely accidental miscarriage of a motor action the linguistic double meaning of these expressions points to diverse hidden fantasies which may present themselves through the giving up of bodily equilibrium i recall a number of lighter nervous ailments in women and girls which made their appearance after falling without injury and which were conceived as traumatic hysteria as a result of the shock of the fall at that time i already entertained the impression that these conditions had a different connection that the fall was already a preparation of the neurosis and an expression of the same unconscious fantasies of sexual content which may be taken as the moving forces behind the symptoms was not this very thing meant in the proverb which says when a maiden falls she falls on her back we can also add to these mistakes the case of one who gives a beggar a gold piece in place of a copper or a silver coin the solution of such mishandling is simple it is an act of sacrifice designed to mollify fate to avert evil and so on if we hear a tender mother or aunt express concern regarding the health of a child directly before taking a walk during which she displays her charity contrary to her usual habit we can no longer doubt the sense of this apparently undesirable accident in this manner our faulty acts make possible the practice of all those pious and superstitious customs which must shun the light of consciousness because of the strivings against them in our unbelieving reason f that accidental actions are really intentional will find no greater credence in any other sphere than in sexual activity where the border between the intention and the accident hardly seems discernible that an apparently clumsy movement may be utilized in a most refined way for sexual purposes i can verify by a nice example from my own experience in a friend's house i met a young girl visitor who excited in me a feeling of fondness which i had long believed extinct thus putting me in a jovial loquacious and complacent mood at that time i endeavored to find out how this came about as a year before this same girl made no impression on me as the girl's uncle a very old man entered the room we both jumped to our feet to bring him a chair which stood in the corner she was more agile than i and also nearer the object so that she was the first to take possession of the chair she carried it with its back to her holding both hands on the edge of the seat as i got there later and did not give up the claim to carrying the chair i suddenly stood directly back of her and with both my arms was embracing her from behind and for a moment my hands touched her lap 
i naturally solved the situation as quickly as it came about nor did it occur to anybody how dexterously i had taken advantage of this awkward movement occasionally i have had to admit to myself that the annoying awkward stepping aside on the street whereby for some seconds one steps here and there yet always in the same direction as the other person until finally both stop facing each other that is barring one's way repeats in ill-mannered provoking conduct of earlier times and conceals erotic purposes under the mask of awkwardness from my psychoanalysis of neurotics i know that the so-called naivete of young people and children is frequently only such a mask employed in order that the subject may say or do the indecent without restraint w steckel has reported similar observations in regard to himself Quote, i entered a house and offered my right hand to the hostess in a most remarkable way i thereby loosened the bow which held together her loose morning gown i was conscious of no dishonorable intent still i executed this awkward movement with the agility of a juggler End quote. g the effects which result from mistakes of normal persons are as a rule of a most harmless nature just for this reason it would be particularly interesting to find out whether mistakes of considerable importance which could be followed by serious results as for example those of physicians or druggists fall within the range of our point of view as i am seldom in a position to deal with active medical matters i can only report one mistake from my own experience i treated a very old woman whom i visited twice daily for several years my medical activities were limited to two acts which i performed during my morning visits i dropped a few drops of an eye lotion into her eyes and gave her a hypodermic injection of morphine i prepared regularly two bottles a blue one containing the eye lotion and a white one containing the morphine solution while performing these duties my thoughts were mostly occupied with something else for they had been repeated so often that the attention acted as if free one morning i noticed that the automaton worked wrong i had put the dropper into the white instead of into the blue bottle and had dropped into the eyes the morphine instead of the lotion i was greatly frightened but then calmed myself through the reflection that a few drops of a two per cent solution of morphine would not likely do any harm even if left in the conjunctival sac the cause of the fright manifestly belonged elsewhere in attempting to analyze the slight mistake i first thought of the phrase to seize the old woman by mistake which pointed out the short way to the solution i had been impressed by a dream which a young man had told me the previous evening the contents of which could be explained only on the basis of sexual intercourse with his own mother the strangeness of the fact that the oedipus legend takes no offence at the age of queen jocasta seemed to me to agree with the assumption that in being in love with one's mother we never deal with the present personality but with her youthful memory picture carried over from our childhood such incongruities always show themselves where one fantasy fluctuating between two periods is made conscious and is then bound to one definite period deep in thoughts of this kind i came to my patient of over ninety i must have been well on the way to grasp the universal character of the oedipus fable as the correlation of the fate which the oracle pronounces for i made a blunder in reference to or on the old woman here again the mistake was harmless of the two possible errors taking the morphine solution for the eye or the eye lotion for the injection i chose the one by far the least harmful the question still remains open whether in mistakes in handling things which may cause serious harm we can assume an unconscious intention as in the cases here discussed the following case from brill's experience corroborates the assumption that even serious mistakes are determined by unconscious intentions Quote, a physician received a telegram informing him that his aged uncle was very sick 
in spite of important family affairs at home he at once repaired to that distant town because his uncle was really his father who had cared for him since he was one and a half years old when his own father had died on reaching there he found his uncle suffering from pneumonia and as the old man was an octogenarian the doctors held out no hope for his recovery it was simply a question of a day or two was the local doctor's verdict although a prominent physician in a big city he refused to cooperate in the treatment as he found that the case was properly managed by the local doctor and he could not suggest anything to improve matters since death was daily expected he decided to remain to the end he waited a few days but the sick man struggled hard and although there was no question of any recovery because of the many new complications which had arisen death seemed to be deferred for a while one night before retiring he went into the sick room and took his uncle's pulse as it was quite weak he decided not to wait for the doctor and administered a hypodermic injection the patient grew rapidly worse and died within a few hours there was something strange in the last symptoms and on later attempting to replace the tube of hypodermic tablets into the case he found to his consternation that he had taken out the wrong tube and instead of a small dose of digitalis he had given a large dose of hyoscine this case was related to me by the doctor after he read my paper on the oedipus complex we agreed that this mistake was determined not only by his impatience to get home to his sick child but also by an old resentment and unconscious hostility toward his uncle father it is known that in the more serious cases of psychoneuroses one sometimes finds self-mutilations as symptoms of the disease that the psychic conflict may end in suicide can never be excluded in these cases thus i know from experience which some day i shall support with convincing examples that many apparently accidental injuries happening to such persons are really self-inflicted this is brought about by the fact that there is a constantly lurking tendency to self-punishment usually expressing itself in self-reproach or contributing to the formation of a symptom which skillfully makes use of an external situation the required external situation may accidentally present itself or the punishment tendency may assist it until the way is open for the desired injurious effect such occurrences are by no means rare even in cases of moderate severity and they betray the portion of unconscious intention through a series of special features for example through the striking presence of mind which the patients show in the pretended accidents i will report exhaustively one in place of many such examples from my professional experience a young woman broke her leg below the knee in a carriage accident so that she was bedridden for weeks the striking part of it was the lack of any manifestation of pain and the calmness with which she bore her misfortune this calamity ushered in a long and serious neurotic illness from which she was finally cured by psychotherapy during the treatment i discovered the circumstances surrounding the accident as well as certain impressions which preceded it the young woman with her jealous husband spent some time on the farm of her married sister in company with her numerous other brothers and sisters and with their wives and husbands one evening she gave an exhibition of one of her talents before this intimate circle she danced artistically the can-can to the great delight of her relatives but to the great annoyance of her husband who afterward whispered to her again you have behaved like a prostitute the words took effect we will leave it undecided whether it was just on account of the dance that night she was restless in her sleep and the next forenoon she decided to go out driving she chose the horses herself refusing one team and demanding another her youngest sister wished to have her baby with its nurse accompany her but she opposed this vehemently during the drive she was nervous she reminded the coachman that the horses were getting skittish and as the fidgety animals really produced a momentary difficulty she jumped from the carriage in fright and broke her leg while those remaining in the carriage were uninjured although after the disclosure of these details we can hardly doubt that this accident was really contrived 
it cannot fail to admire the skill which forced the accident to mete out a punishment so suitable to the crime for as it happened can-can dancing with her became impossible for a long time concerning self-inflicted injuries of my own experience i cannot report anything in calm times but under extraordinary conditions i do not believe myself incapable of such acts when a member of my family complains that he or she has bitten his tongue bruised her finger and so on instead of the expected sympathy i put the question why did you do that but i have most painfully squeezed my thumb after a youthful patient acquainted me during the treatment with his intention naturally not to be taken seriously of marrying my eldest daughter while i knew that she was then in a private hospital in extreme danger of losing her life one of my boys whose vivacious temperament was wont to put difficulties in the management of nursing him in his illness had a fit of anger one morning because he was ordered to remain in bed during the forenoon and threatened to kill himself a way out suggested to him by the newspapers in the evening he showed me a swelling on the side of his chest which was the result of bumping against the doorknob to my ironical question why he did it and what he meant by it the eleven-year-old child explained that was my attempt at suicide which i threatened this morning however i did not believe that my views on self-inflicted wounds were accessible to my children at that time whoever believes in the occurrence of semi-intentional self-inflicted injury if this awkward expression be permitted will become prepared to accept through it the fact that aside from conscious intentional suicide there also exists semi-intentional annihilation with unconscious intentions which is capable of aptly utilizing a threat against life and masking it as a casual mishap such mechanism is by no means rare for the tendency to self-destruction exists to a certain degree in many more persons than in those who bring it to completion self-inflicted injuries are as a rule a compromise between this impulse and the forces working against it and even where it really comes to suicide the inclination has existed for a long time with less strength or as an unconscious and repressed tendency even suicide consciously committed chooses its time means and opportunity it is quite natural that unconscious suicide should wait for a motive to take upon itself one part of the causation and thus free it from its oppression by taking up the defensive forces of the person these are in no way idle discussions which i here bring up more than one case of apparently accidental misfortune on a horse or out of a carriage has become known to me whose surrounding circumstances justified the suspicion of suicide for example during an officer's horse race one of the riders fell from his horse and was so seriously injured that a few days later he succumbed to his injuries his behavior after regaining consciousness was remarkable in more than one way and his conduct previous to the accident was still more remarkable he had been greatly depressed by the death of his beloved mother had crying spells in the society of his comrades and to his trusted friends had spoken of the tedium vitae he had wished to quit the service in order to take part in a war in africa which had no interest for him formerly a keen rider he had later evaded riding whenever possible finally before the horse race from which he could not withdraw he expressed a sad foreboding which most expectedly in the light of our conception came true it may be contended that it is quite comprehensible without any further cause that a person in such a state of nervous depression cannot manage a horse as well as on normal days i quite agree with that only i should think to look for the mechanism of this motor inhibition through nervousness in the intention of self-destruction here emphasized dr ferenzi has left to me for publication the analysis of an apparently accidental injury by shooting which he explained as an unconscious attempt at suicide i can only agree with his deduction Quote, j a twenty two years old carpenter visited me on the eighteenth of january nineteen o eight 
he wished to know whether the bullet which pierced his left temple march twentieth nineteen o seven could or should be removed by operation aside from occasional not very severe headaches he felt quite well also the objective examination showed nothing besides the characteristic powder wound on the left temple so that i advised against an operation when questioned concerning the circumstances of the case he asserted that he injured himself accidentally he was playing with his brother's revolver and believing that it was not loaded he pressed it with his left hand against the left temple he is not left-handed put his finger on the trigger and the shot went off there were three bullets in the six-shooter i asked him how he came to carry the revolver and he answered that it was at the time of his army conscription that he took it to the inn the evening before because he feared fights at the army examination he was considered unfit for service on account of varicose veins which caused him much mortification he went home and played with the revolver he had no intention of hurting himself but the accident occurred on further questioning whether he was otherwise satisfied with his fortune he answered with a sigh and related a love affair with a girl who loved him in return but nevertheless left him she emigrated to america out of sheer avariciousness he wanted to follow her but his parents prevented him his lady love left on the twentieth of january nineteen o seven just two months before the accident despite all these suspicious elements the patients insisted that the shot was an accident i was firmly convinced however that the neglect to find out whether the revolver was loaded before he began to play with it as well as the self-inflicted wound were physically determined he was still under the depressing effects of the unhappy love affair and apparently wanted to forget everything in the army when this hope too was taken away from him he resorted to playing with the weapon that is to an unconscious attempt at suicide the fact that he did not hold the revolver in the right but in the left hand speaks conclusively in favor of the fact that he was really only playing that is he did not wish consciously to commit suicide End quote. another analysis of an apparently accidental self-inflicted wound detailed to me by an observer recalls the saying he who digs a pit for others falls in himself quote, mrs x belonging to a good middle-class family is married and has three children she is somewhat nervous but never needed any strenuous treatment as she could sufficiently adapt herself to life one day she sustained a rather striking though transitory disfigurement of her face in the following manner she stumbled in a street that was in process of repair and struck her face against the house wall the whole face was bruised the eyelids blue and edematous and as she feared that something might happen to her eyes she sent for the doctor after she was calmed i asked her but why did you fall in such a manner she answered that just before the accident she warned her husband who had been suffering for some months from a joint affliction to be very careful in the street and she often had the experience that in some remarkable way those things occurred to her against which she warned others i was not satisfied with this as the determination of her accident and asked her whether she had not something else to tell me yes just before the accident she noticed a nice picture in a shop on the other side of the street which she suddenly desired as an ornament for her nursery and wished to buy it at once she thereupon walked across to the shop without looking at the street stumbled over a heap of stones and fell with her face against the wall without making the slightest effort to shield herself with her hands the intention to buy the picture was immediately forgotten and she walked home in haste but why were you not more careful i asked oh she said perhaps it was only a punishment for that episode which i confided to you has this episode still bothered you yes later i regretted it very much i considered myself wicked criminal and immoral but at the time i was almost crazy with nervousness she referred to an abortion which was started by a quack and had to be brought to completion by a gynecologist this abortion was initiated with the consent of her husband as both wished on account of their pecuniary circumstances to be spared from being additionally blessed with children 
she said i had often reproached myself with the words you really had your child killed and i feared that such a crime would not remain unpunished now that you have assured me that there is nothing seriously wrong with my eyes i am quite assured i have already been sufficiently punished this accident therefore was on the one hand a retribution for her sin but on the other hand it may have served as an escape from a more dire punishment which she had feared for many months in the moment that she ran to the shop to buy the picture the memory of this whole history with its fears already quite active in her unconscious at the time she warned her husband became overwhelming and could perhaps find expression in words like these but why do you want an ornament for the nursery you who had your child killed you are a murderer the great punishment is surely approaching this thought did not become conscious but instead of it she made use of the situation i might say of the psychologic moment to utilize in a commonplace manner the heap of stones to inflict upon herself this punishment it was for this reason that she did not even attempt to put out her arms while falling and was not much frightened the second and probably lesser determinant of her accident was obviously the self-punishment for her unconscious wish to be rid of her husband who was an accessory to the crime in this affair this was betrayed by her absolutely superfluous warning to be very careful in the street on account of the stones for just because her husband had a weak leg he was very careful in walking if such a rage against one's own integrity in one's own life can be hidden behind apparently accidental awkwardness and motor insufficiency then it is not a big step forward to grasp the possibility of transferring the same conception to mistakes which seriously endanger the life and health of others what i can put forward as evidence for the validity of this conception was taken from my experience with neurotics and hence does not fully meet the demands of this situation i will report a case in which it was not an erroneously carried out act but what may be more aptly termed a symbolic or chance action that gave me the clue which later made possible the solution of the patient's conflict i once undertook to improve the marriage relations of a very intelligent man whose differences with his tenderly attached young wife could surely be traced to real causes but he himself admitted could not be altogether explained through them he continually occupied himself with the thought of a separation which he repeatedly rejected because he dearly loved his two small children in spite of this he always returned to that resolution and sought no means to make the situation bearable to himself such an unsettlement of a conflict served to prove to me that there were unconscious and repressed motives which enforced the conflicting conscious thoughts and in such cases i always undertake to end the conflict by psychic analysis one day the man related to me a slight occurrence which had extremely frightened him he was sporting with the older child by far his favorite he tossed it high in the air and repeated this tossing till finally he thrust it so high that its head almost struck the massive gas chandelier almost but not quite or say just about nothing happened to the child except that it became dizzy from fright the father stood transfixed with the child in his arms while the mother merged into an hysterical attack the particular facility of this careless movement with the violent reaction in the parents suggested to me to look upon this accident as a symbolic action which gave expression to an evil intention toward the beloved child i could remove the contradiction of the actual tenderness of this father for his child by referring the impulse to injure it to the time when it was only one and so small that as yet the father had no occasion for tender interest in it then it was easy to assume that this man so little pleased with his wife at that time might have thought if this small being for whom i have no regard whatever should die i would be free and could separate from my wife the wish for the death of this much-loved being must therefore have continued unconsciously from here it was easy to find the way to the unconscious fixation of this wish there was indeed a powerful determinant in a memory from the patient's childhood it referred to the death of a little brother which the mother laid to his father's negligence 
and which led to serious quarrels with threats of separation between the parents the continued course of my patient's life as well as the therapeutic success confirmed my analysis end of chapter eight nine of psychopathology of everyday life this librivox recording is in the public domain psychopathology of everyday life by sigmund freud translated by a a brill recorded by mary schneider chapter nine symptomatic and chance actions the actions described so far in which we recognize the execution of an unconscious intention appeared as disturbances of other unintended actions and hid themselves under the pretext of awkwardness chance actions which we shall now discuss differ from erroneously carried out actions only in that they disdain the support of a conscious intention and really need no pretext they appear independently and are accepted because one does not credit them with any aim or purpose we execute them without thinking anything of them by mere chance just to keep the hands busy and we feel confident that such information will be quite sufficient should one inquire as to their significance in order to enjoy the advantage of this exceptional position these actions which no longer claim awkwardness as an excuse must fulfil certain conditions they must not be striking and their effects must be insignificant i have collected a large number of such chance actions from myself and others and after thoroughly investigating the individual examples i believe that the name symptomatic actions is more suitable they give expression to something which the actor himself does not suspect in them and which as a rule he has no intention of imparting to others but aims to keep to himself like the other phenomena considered so far they thus play the part of symptoms the richest output of such chance or symptomatic actions is above all obtained in the psychoanalytic treatment of neurotics i cannot deny myself the pleasure of showing by two examples of this nature how far and how delicately the determination of these plain occurrences are swayed by unconscious thoughts the line of demarcation between the symptomatic actions and the erroneously carried out actions is so indefinite that i could have disposed of these examples in the preceding chapter a during the analysis a young woman reproduced this idea which suddenly occurred to her yesterday while cutting her nails she had cut into the flesh while engaged in trimming the cuticle this is of so little interest that we ask in astonishment why it is at all remembered and mentioned and therefore come to the conclusion that we deal with a symptomatic action it was really the finger upon which the wedding ring is worn which was injured through this slight awkwardness it happened moreover on her wedding day which thus gives to the injury of the delicate skin a very definite and easily guessed meaning at the same time she also related a dream which alluded to the awkwardness of her husband and her anesthesia as a woman but why did she injure the ring finger of her left hand when the wedding ring is worn on the right her husband is a jurist a doctor of laws doctor direct literally a doctor of rights and her secret affection as a girl belonged to a physician who was jokingly called doctor de link literally doctor of left incidentally a left-handed marriage has a definite meaning b a single young woman relates yesterday quite unintentionally i tore a hundred dollar note in two pieces and gave half to a woman who was visiting me is that too a symptomatic action after close investigation the matter of the hundred dollar note elicited the following associations she dedicated a part of her time and her fortune to charitable work together with another woman she was taking care of the rearing of an orphan the hundred dollars was the contribution sent her by that woman which she enclosed in an envelope and provisionally deposited on her writing desk the visitor was a prominent woman with whom she was associated in another act of charity 
this woman wished to note the names of a number of persons to whom she could apply for charitable aid there was no paper so my patient grasped the envelope from her desk and without thinking of its contents tore it in two pieces one of which she kept in order to have a duplicate list of names and gave the other to her visitor note the harmlessness of this aimless occurrence it is known that a hundred dollar note suffers no loss in value when it is torn provided all the pieces are produced that the woman would not throw away the piece of paper was assumed by the importance of the names on it and there was just as little doubt that she would return the valuable content as soon as she noticed it but to what unconscious thought should this chance action which was made possible through forgetfulness give expression the visitor in this case had a very definite relation to my patient and myself it was she who at one time had recommended me as physician to the suffering girl and if i am not mistaken my patient considered herself indebted for this advice should this halved hundred dollar note perhaps represent a fee for her mediation that still remained enigmatic but other material was added to this beginning several days before a woman mediator of a different sort had inquired of a relative whether the gracious young lady wished to make the acquaintance of a certain gentleman and that morning some hours before the woman's visit the wooing letter of the suitor arrived giving occasion for much mirth when therefore the visitor opened the conversation with inquiries regarding the health of my patient the latter could well have thought you certainly found me the right doctor but if you could assist me in obtaining the right husband and a child i should be still more grateful both mediators became fused into one in this repressed thought and she handed the visitor the fee which her fantasy was ready to give the other this resolution became perfectly convincing when i add that i had told her of such chance or symptomatic actions only the previous evening she then took advantage of the next occasion to produce an analogous action we can undertake a grouping of these extremely frequent chance and symptomatic actions according to their occurrence as habitual regular under certain circumstances and as isolated ones the first group such as playing with the watch chain fingering one's beard and so on which can almost serve as a characteristic of the person concerned is related to the numerous tick movements and certainly deserves to be dealt with in connection with the latter in the second group i place the playing with one's cane the scribbling with one's pencil the jingling of coins in one's pocket kneading dough and other plastic materials all sorts of handling of one's clothing and many other actions of the same order these playful occupations during psychic treatment regularly conceal sense and meaning to which other expression is denied generally the person in question knows nothing about it he is unaware whether he is doing the same thing or whether he has imitated certain modifications in his customary playing and he also fails to see or hear the effects of these actions for example he does not hear the noise which is produced by the jingling of coins and he is astonished and incredulous when his attention is called to it of equal significance to the physician and worthy of his observation is everything that one does with his clothing often without noticing it every change in the customary attire every little negligence such as an unfastened button every trace of exposure means to express something that the wearer of the apparel does not wish to say directly usually he is entirely unconscious of it the interpretation of these trifling chance actions as well as the proof for their interpretation can be demonstrated every time with sufficient certainty from the surrounding circumstances during the treatment from the themes under discussion and from the ideas that come to the surface when attention is directed to the seeming accident because of this connection i will refrain from supporting my assertions by reporting examples with their analyses but i mention these matters because i believe that they have the same meaning in normal persons as in my patients 
i cannot however refrain from showing by at least one example how closely an habitually accomplished symbolic action may be connected with the most intimate and important part of the life of a normal individual Quote, as professor freud has taught us the symbolism in the infantile life of the normal plays a greater role than was expected from earlier psychoanalytic experiences in view of this the following brief analysis may be of general interest especially on account of its medical aspects a doctor on rearranging his furniture in a new house came across a straight wooden stethoscope and after pausing to decide where he should put it was impelled to place it on the side of his writing desk in such a position that it stood exactly between his chair and the one reserved for his patients the act in itself was certainly odd for in the first place the straight stethoscope served no purpose as he invariably used a binaural one and in the second place all his medical apparatus and instruments were always kept in drawers with the sole exception of this one however he gave no thought to the matter until one day it was brought to his notice by a patient who had never seen a wooden stethoscope asking him what it was on being told she asked why he kept it there he answered in an off-hand way that that place was as good as any other this however started him thinking and he wondered whether there had been an unconscious motive in his action being interested in the psychoanalytic method he asked me to investigate the matter the first memory that occurred to him was the fact that when a medical student he had been struck by the habit his hospital intern had of always carrying in his hand a wooden stethoscope on his ward visits although he never used it he greatly admired this intern and was much attached to him later on when he himself became an intern he contracted the same habit and would feel very uncomfortable if by mistake he left the room without having the instrument to swing in his hand the aimlessness of the habit was shown not only by the fact that the only stethoscope he ever used was a binaural one which he carried in his pocket but also in that it was continued when he was a surgical intern and never needed any stethoscope at all from this it is evident that the idea of the instrument in question had in some way or other become invested with a greater psychic significance than normally belongs to it in other words that to the subject it stood for more than it does for other people the idea must have got unconsciously associated with some other one which it symbolized and from which it derived its additional fullness of meaning i will forestall the rest of the analysis by saying what this secondary idea was namely a phallic one the way in which this curious association had been formed will presently be related the discomfort he experienced in hospital on missing the instrument and the relief and assurance the presence of it gave him was related to what is known as a castration complex namely a childhood fear often continued in a disguided form into adult life lest a private part of his body should be taken away from him just as playthings so often were the fear was due to paternal threats that it would be cut off if he were not a good boy particularly in a certain direction this is a very common complex and accounts for a great deal of general nervousness and lack of confidence in later years then came a number of childhood memories relating to his family doctor he had been strongly attached to this doctor as a child and during the analysis long buried memories were recovered of a double fantasy he had in his fourth year concerning the birth of a younger sister namely that she was the child one of himself and his mother the father being relegated to the background and two of the doctor and himself in this he thus played both a masculine and feminine part at the time when his curiosity was being aroused by the event he could not help noticing the prominent share taken by the doctor in the proceedings and the subordinate position occupied by the father the significance of this for his later life will presently be pointed out the stethoscope association was formed through many connections 
in the first place the physical appearance of the instrument a straight rigid hollow tube having a small bulbous summit at one extremity and a broad base at the other and the fact of its being the essential part of the medical paraphernalia the instrument with which the doctor performed his magical and interesting feats were matters that attracted his boyish attention he had had his chest repeatedly examined by the doctor at the age of six and distinctly recollected the voluptuous sensation of feeling the latter's head near him pressing the wood stethoscope into his chest and the rhythmic to and fro respiratory movement he had been struck by the doctor's habit of carrying his stethoscope inside his hat he found it interesting that the doctor should carry this chief instrument concealed about his person always handy when he went to see patients and that he only had to take off his hat that is a part of his clothing and pull it out at the age of eight he was impressed by being told by an older boy that it was the doctor's custom to get into bed with his women patients it is certain that the doctor who was young and handsome was extremely popular among the women of the neighborhood including the subject's own mother the doctor and his instrument were therefore the objects of great interest throughout his boyhood it is probable that as in many other cases unconscious identification with the family doctor had been a main motive in determining the subject's choice of profession it was here doubly conditioned one by the superiority of the doctor on certain interesting occasions to the father of whom the subject was very jealous and two by the doctor's knowledge of forbidden topics and his opportunity for illicit indulgence the subject admitted that he had on several occasions experienced erotic temptations in regard to his women patients he had twice fallen in love with one and finally married one the next memory was of a dream plainly of a homosexual masochistic nature in it a man who proved to be a replacement figure of the family doctor attacked the subject with a sword the idea of a sword as is so frequently the case in dreams represented the same idea that was mentioned above to be associated with that of a wooden stethoscope the thought of a sword reminded the subject of the passage in the Niebling saga where sigurd sleeps with his naked sword graham between him and brunhilde an incident that had always greatly struck his imagination the meaning of the symptomatic act now at last became clear the subject had placed his wooden stethoscope between him and his patients just as sigurd had placed his sword an equivalent symbol between him and the maiden he was not to touch the act was a compromise formation it served both to gratify in his imagination the repressed wish to enter into nearer relations with an attractive patient interposition of phallus and at the same time to remind him that this wish was not to become a reality interposition of sword it was so to speak a charm against yielding to temptation i might add that the following passage from lord lytton's richelieu made a great impression on the boy beneath the rule of men entirely great the pen is mightier than the sword and that he became a prolific writer and uses an unusually large fountain pen when i asked him what need he had of this pen he replied in a characteristic manner i have so much to express this analysis again reminds us of the profound views that are afforded us in the psychic life through the harmless and senseless actions and how early in life the tendency to symbolization develops i can also relate an experience from my psychotherapeutic practice in which the hand playing with a mass of bread-crumbs gave evidence of an eloquent declaration my patient was a boy not yet thirteen years of age who had been very hysterical for two years i finally took him for psychoanalytic treatment after a lengthy stay at a hypertherapeutic institution had proved futile my supposition was that he must have had sexual experiences and that corresponding to his age he had been troubled by sexual questions but i was cautious about helping him with explanations as i wished to test further my assumption 
i was therefore curious as to the manner in which the desired material would evince itself in him one day it struck me that he was rolling something between the fingers of his right hand he would thrust it into his pocket and there continue playing with it then would draw it out again and so on i did not ask what he had in his hand but as he suddenly opened his hand he showed it to me it was bread-crumbs kneaded into a mass at the next session he again brought along a mass and in the course of our conversation although his eyes were closed modelled a figure with an incredible rapidity which excited my interest without doubt it was a mannequin like the crudest prehistoric idols with a head two arms two legs and an appendage between the legs which he drew out to a long point this was scarcely completed when he kneaded the mannequin together again later he allowed it to remain but modelled an identical appendage in the flat of the back and on other parts in order to veil the meaning of the first i wished to show him that i had understood him but at the same time i wanted to deprive him of the evasion that he had thought of nothing while actively forming these figures with this intention i suddenly asked him whether he remembered the story of a roman king who gave his son's envoy a pantomimic answer in his garden the boy did not wish to recall what he must have learned so much more recently than i he asked if that was the story of the slave on whose bald skull the answer was written i told him no that belonged to greek history and related the following king tarquinius superbus had induced his son sextus to steal into a latin city the son who had later obtained a foothold in the city sent a messenger to the king asking what steps he should take next the king gave no answer but went into his garden had the question repeated there and silently struck off the heads of the largest and most beautiful poppies all that the messenger could do was to report this to sextus who understood his father and caused the most distinguished citizens of the city to be removed by assassination while i was speaking the boy stopped kneading and as i was relating what the king did in his garden i noticed that at the words silently struck he tore off the head of the mannequin with a movement as quick as lightning he therefore understood me and showed that he was also understood by me now i could question him directly and gave him the information that he desired and in short time the neurosis came to an end the symptomatic actions which we observe in inexhaustible abundance in healthy as well as in nervous people are worthy of our interest for more than one reason to the physician they often serve as valuable indications for orienting himself in new or unfamiliar conditions to the keen observer they often betray everything occasionally even more than he cares to know he who is familiar with its application sometimes feels like king solomon who according to the oriental legend understood the language of animals one day i was to examine a strange young man at his mother's home as he came towards me i was attracted by a large stain on his trousers which by its peculiar stiff edges i recognized as one produced by albumen after a moment's embarrassment the young man excused this stain by remarking that he was hoarse and therefore drank a raw egg and that some of the slippery white of the egg had probably fallen on his clothes to confirm his statement he showed the eggshell which could still be seen on a small plate in the room the suspicious spot was thus explained in this harmless way but as his mother left us alone i thanked him for having so greatly facilitated the diagnosis for me and without further procedure i took as the topic of our discussion his confession that he was suffering from the effects of masturbation another time i called on a woman as rich as she was miserly and foolish who was in the habit of giving the physician the task of working his way through a heap of her complaints before he could reach the simple cause of her condition as i entered she was sitting at a small table engaged in arranging silver dollars in little piles as she rose she tumbled some of the pieces of money to the floor 
i helped her pick them up but interrupted the recitation of her misery by remarking has your good son-in-law been spending so much of your money again she bitterly denied this only to relate a few moments later the lamentable story of the aggravation caused by her son-in-law's extravagances and she has not sent for me since i cannot maintain that one always makes friends of those to whom he tells the meaning of their symptomatic actions he who observes his fellow-men while at table will be able to verify in them the nicest and most instructive symptomatic actions dr hans sachs relates the following quote, i happened to be present when an elderly couple related to me partook of their supper the lady had stomach trouble and was forced to follow a strict diet a roast was put before the husband and he requested his wife who was not allowed to partake of this food to give him the mustard the wife opened the closet and took out the small bottle of stomach drops and placed it on the table before her husband between the barrel-shaped mustard glass and the small drop bottle there was naturally no similarity through which the mishandling could be explained yet the wife only noticed the mistake after her husband laughingly called her attention to it the sense of this symptomatic action needs no explanation End quote. for an excellent example of this kind which was very skilfully utilized by the observer i am indebted to dr baron datner of vienna quote, i dined in a restaurant with my colleague h a doctor of philosophy he spoke about the injustice done to probationary students and added that even before he finished his studies he was placed as secretary to the ambassador or rather the extraordinary plenipotentiary minister to chile but he added the minister was afterwards transferred and i did not make an effort to meet the newly appointed while uttering the last sentence he was lifting a piece of pie to his mouth but he let it drop as if out of awkwardness i immediately grasped the hidden sense of this symptomatic action and remarked to my colleague who was unacquainted with psychoanalysis you really allowed a very choice morsel to slip from you he did not realize however that my words could equally refer to his symptomatic action and he repeated the same words i uttered with a peculiarly agreeable and surprising vividness as if i had actually taken the words from his mouth it was really a very choice morsel that i allowed to get away from me he then followed this remark with a detailed description of his clumsiness which has cost him this very remunerative position the sense of this symbolic action becomes clearer if we remember that my colleague had scruples about telling me almost a perfect stranger concerning his precarious material situation and his repressed thought took on the mask of symptomatic action which expressed symbolically what was meant to be concealed and the speaker thus got relief from his unconscious End quote that the taking away or taking along things without any apparent intention may prove to be senseful may be shown by the following examples one dr b datner relates quote, an acquaintance paid the first after-marriage visit to a highly regarded lady friend of his youth he told me of this visit and expressed his surprise at the fact that he failed in his resolution to visit with her only a short time and then reported to me a rather strange faulty act which happened to him there the husband of this friend who took part in the conversation was looking for a box of matches which he was sure was on the table when he came there my acquaintance too looked through his pockets to ascertain whether he had not put it in his pocket but without avail some time later he actually found it in his pocket and was struck by the fact that there was only one match in the box a dream a few days later showing the box symbolism in reference to the friend of his youth confirmed my explanation with the symptomatic action my acquaintance meant to announce his priority right and the exclusiveness of his position it contained only one match dr hans sachs relates the following quote, our cook is very fond of a certain kind of pie there is no possible doubt about this as it is the only kind of pastry which she always prepares well one sunday she brought this pie to the table 
took it off the pie plate and proceeded to remove the dishes used in the former course but on the top of this pile she placed the pie and disappeared with it into the kitchen we first thought that she had something to improve on the pie but as she failed to appear my wife rang the bell and asked betty what happened to the pie to which the girl answered without comprehending the question how's that we had to call her attention to the fact that she carried the pie back to the kitchen she had put it on a pile of dishes taken it out and put it away without noticing it the next day when we were about to consume the rest of the pie my wife noticed that there was as much of it as we had left the day before that is the girl had disdained to eat the portion of her favorite dish which was rightly hers questioned why she did not eat the pie she answered somewhat embarrassed that she did not care for it the infantile attitude is distinctly noticeable on both occasions first the childish insatiableness in refusing to share with anybody the object of her wishes then the reaction of spite which is just as childish if you grudge it to me keep it to yourself i want nothing of it End quote chance or symptomatic actions occurring in affairs of married life have often a most serious significance and could lead those who do not concern themselves with the psychology of the unconscious to a belief in omens it is not an auspicious beginning if a young woman loses her wedding ring on her wedding tour even if it were only mislaid and soon found i know a woman now divorced who in the management of her business affairs frequently signed her maiden name many years before she actually resumed it once i was the guest of a newly married couple and heard the young woman laughingly relate her latest experience how on the day succeeding her return from the wedding tour she had sought out her single sister in order to go shopping with her as in former times while her husband was attending business suddenly she noticed a man on the opposite side of the street nudging her sister she said why that is surely mr l she forgot that for some weeks this man had been her husband i was chilled at this tale but i did not dare draw any inferences the little story came back to me only several years later after this marriage had ended most unhappily the following observation which could as well have found a place among the examples of forgetting was taken from a noteworthy work published in french by a mater statement in french follows a friend who has learned to observe signs related to me that the great actress eleonora duce introduces a symptomatic action into one of her roles which shows very nicely from what depth she draws her acting it is a drama dealing with adultery she has just been discussing with her husband and now stands soliloquizing before the seducer makes his appearance during this short interval she plays with her wedding ring she pulls it off replaces it and finally takes it off again she is now ready for the other i know of an elderly man who married a young girl and instead of starting at once on his wedding tour he decided to spend the night in a hotel scarcely had they reached the hotel when he noticed with fright that he was without his wallet in which he had the entire sum of money for the wedding tour he must have mislaid or lost it he was still able to reach his servant by telephone the latter found the missing article in the coat discarded for the travelling clothes and brought it to the hotel to the waiting bridegroom who had thus entered upon his marriage without means it is consoling to think that the losing of objects by people is merely an unsuspected extension of a symptomatic action and is thus welcome at least to the secret intention of the loser often it is only an expression of slight appreciation of the lost article a secret dislike for the same or perhaps for the person from whom it came or the desire to lose this object was transferred to it from other and more important objects through symbolic association the loss of valuable articles serves as an expression of diverse feelings it may either symbolically represent a repressed thought that is it may bring back a memory which one would rather not hear or it may represent a sacrifice to the obscure forces of fate the worship of which is not yet entirely extinct even with us 
the following examples will illustrate these statements concerning the losing of objects dr b datner states a colleague related to me that he lost his steel pencil which he had had for over two years and which on account of its superior quality was highly prized by him analysis elicited the following facts the day before he had received a very disagreeable letter from his brother-in-law the concluding sentence of which read at present i have neither the desire nor the time to assist you in your carelessness and laziness the effect connected with this letter was so powerful that the next day he promptly sacrificed the pencil which was a present from his brother-in-law in order not to be burdened with his favors brill reports the following example a doctor took exception to the following statement in my book we never lose what we really want his wife who is very interested in psychologic subjects read with him the chapter on psychopathology of everyday life they were both very much impressed with the novelty of the ideas and so on and were very willing to accept most of the statements he could not however agree with the above given statement because as he said to his wife i surely did not wish to lose my knife he referred to a valuable knife given to him by his wife which he highly prized the loss of which caused him much pain it did not take his wife very long to discover the solution for this loss in a manner to convince them both of the accuracy of my statement when she presented him with this knife he was a bit loath to accept it although he considered himself quite emancipated he nevertheless entertained some superstition about giving or accepting a knife as a gift because it is said that a knife cuts friendship he even remarked this to his wife who only laughed at his superstition he had the knife for years before it disappeared analysis brought out the fact that the disappearance of the knife was directly connected with the period when there were violent quarrels between himself and his wife which threatened to end in separation they lived happily together until his stepdaughter it was his second marriage came to live with them his daughter was the cause of many misunderstandings and it was at the height of these quarrels that he lost the knife the unconscious activity is very nicely shown in this symptomatic action in spite of his apparent freedom from superstition he still unconsciously believed that a donated knife may cut friendship between the persons concerned the losing of it was simply an unconscious defense against losing his wife and by sacrificing the knife he made the superstitious ban impotent in a lengthy discussion with the aid of dream analysis otto rank made clear the sacrificial tendency with its deep-reaching motivation it must be said that just such symptomatic actions often give us access to the understanding of the intimate psychic life of the person of the many isolated chance actions i will relate one example which showed a deeper meaning even without analysis this example clearly explains the conditions under which such symptoms may be produced most casually and also shows that an observation of practical importance may be attached to it during a summer tour it happened that i had to wait several days at a certain place for the arrival of my travelling companions in the meantime i made the acquaintance of a young man who also seemed lonely and was quite willing to join me as we lived at the same hotel it was quite natural that we should take all our meals and our walks together on the afternoon of the third day he suddenly informed me that he expected his wife to arrive on that evening's express train my psychologic interest was now aroused as it had struck me that morning that my companion rejected my proposal to make a long excursion and in our short walk he objected to a certain path as too steep and dangerous during our afternoon walk he suddenly thought that i must be hungry and insisted that i should not delay my evening meal on his account that he would not sup before his wife's arrival i understood the hint and seated myself at the table while he went to the station the next morning we met in the foyer of the hotel he presented me to his wife and added of course you will breakfast with us i had to attend first to a small matter in the next street but assured him that i would return shortly 
just as i entered the breakfast-room i noticed that the couple were at a small table near the window both seated on the same side of it on the opposite side there was only one chair which was covered however by a man's large and heavy coat i understood well the meaning of this unintentional none the less expressive disposition of the coat it meant this there is no room for you here you are superfluous now the man did not notice that i remained standing before the table being unable to take the seat but his wife noticed it and quickly nudged her husband and whispered well, you have covered the gentleman's place with your coat these as well as other similar experiences have caused me to think that the actions executed unintentionally must inevitably become the source of misunderstanding in human relations the perpetrator of the act who is unaware of any associated intention takes no account of it and does not hold himself responsible for it on the other hand the second party having regularly utilized even such acts as those of his partner to draw conclusions as to their purpose and meaning recognizes more of the stranger's psychic processes than the latter is ready either to admit or believe that he has imparted he becomes indignant when these conclusions drawn from his symptomatic actions are held up to him he declares them baseless because he does not see any conscious intention in their execution and complains of being misunderstood by the other close examination shows that such misunderstandings are based on the fact that the person is too fine an observer and understands too much the more nervous two persons are the more readily they will give each other cause for disputes which are based on the fact that one as definitely denies about his own person what he is sure to accept about the other and this is indeed the punishment for the inner dishonesty to which people grant expression under the guise of forgetting of erroneous actions and accidental emotions a feeling which they would do better to confess to themselves and others when they can no longer control it as a matter of fact it can be generally affirmed that every one is continually practicing psychoanalysis on his neighbors and consequently learns to know them better than each individual knows himself the road following the admonition know thyself leads through the study of one's own apparently casual commissions and omissions the end of chapter 9ten of psychopathology of everyday life this librivox recording is in the public domain psychopathology of everyday life by sigmund freud translated by a a brill read by mary schneider chapter ten errors errors of memory are distinguished from forgetting and false recollections through one feature only namely that the error false recollection is not recognized as such but finds credence however the use of the expression error seems to depend on still another condition we speak of erring instead of falsely recollecting where the character of the objective reality is emphasized in the psychic material to be reproduced that is where something other than a fact of my own psychic life is to be remembered or rather something that may be confirmed or refuted through the memory of others the reverse of the error in memory in this sense is formed by ignorance in my book the interpretation of dreams i was responsible for a series of errors in historical and above all in material facts which i was astonished to discover after the appearance of the book on closer examination i found that they did not originate from my ignorance but could be traced to errors of memory explainable by means of analysis a on page three sixty one i indicated as schiller's birthplace the city of marburg a name which recurs in styria the error is found in the analysis of a dream during a night journey from which i was awakened by the conductor calling out the name of the station marburg in the contents of the dream inquiry is made concerning a book by schiller but schiller was not born in the university town of marburg but in the swabian city of marbach i maintain i always knew this b on page one sixty five hannibal's father is called hasdrubal 
this error was particularly annoying to me but it is most corroborative of my conception of such errors few readers of the book are better posted on the history of the barkides than the author who wrote this error and overlooked it in three proofs the name of hannibal's father was hamilcar barkus hasdrubal was the name of hannibal's brother as well as that of his brother-in-law and predecessor in command c on pages two seventeen and four ninety two i assert that zeus emasculates his father chronos and hurls him from the throne this horror i have erroneously advanced by a generation according to greek mythology it was chronos who committed this on his father uranus how is it to be explained that my memory furnished me with false material on these points while it usually places the most remote and unusual materials at my disposal as the readers of my books can verify and what is more in three carefully executed proof-readings i passed over these errors as if struck blind goethe said to lichtenberg where he cracks a joke there lies a concealed problem similarly we can affirm of these passages cited from my book back of every error is a repression more accurately stated the error conceals a falsehood a disfigurement which is ultimately based on repressed material in the analysis of the dreams there reported i was compelled by the very nature of the theme to which the dream thoughts related on the one hand to break off the analysis in some places before it had reached its completion and on the other hand to remove an indiscreet detail through a slight disfigurement of its outline i could not act differently and had no other choice if i was at all to offer examples and illustrations my constrained position was necessarily brought about by the peculiarity of dreams which give expression to repressed thoughts or to material which is incapable of being conscious in spite of this it is said that enough material remained to offend the most sensitive souls the disfigurement or concealment of the continuing thoughts known to me could not be accomplished without leaving some trace what i wish to repress has often against my will obtruded itself on what i have taken up and evinced itself in the matter as an unnoticeable error indeed each of the three examples given is based on the same theme the errors are the results of repressed thoughts which occupy themselves with my deceased father at a whoever reads through the dream analyzed on page three sixty one will find some parts unveiled in some parts he will be able to divine through allusions that i have broken off the thoughts which would have contained an unfavorable criticism of my father in the continuation of this line of thoughts and memories there lies an annoying tale in which books and a business friend of my father named marburg play a part it is the same name the calling out of which in the southern railway station had aroused me from sleep i wish to suppress this mr marburg in the analysis from myself and my readers he avenged himself by intruding where he did not belong and changed the name of schiller's birthplace from marbach to marburg ad b the error hasdrubal in place of hamilcar the name of the brother instead of that of the father originated from an association which dealt with the hannibal fantasies of my college years and my dissatisfaction with the conduct of my father toward the enemies of our people i could have continued and recounted how my attitude toward my father was changed by a visit to england where i made the acquaintance of my half-brother by a previous marriage of my father my brother's oldest son was my age exactly thus the age relations were no hindrance to a fantasy which may be stated thus how much pleasanter it would be had i been born the son of my brother instead of the son of my father this suppressed fantasy then falsified the text of my book at the point where i broke off the analysis by forcing me to put the name of the brother for that of the father odd c the influence of the memory of this same brother is responsible for my having advanced by a generation the mythological horror of the greek deities one of the admonitions of my brother has lingered long in my memory do not forget one thing concerning your conduct in life he said you belong not to the second but really to the third generation of your father 
our father had remarried at an advanced age and was therefore an old man to his children by the second marriage i commit the error mentioned where i discuss the piety between parents and children several times friends and patients have called my attention to the fact that in reporting their dreams or alluding to them in dream analyses i have related inaccurately the circumstances experienced by us in common these are also historic errors in re-examining such individual cases i have found that my recollection of the facts was unreliable only where i had purposely disfigured or concealed something in the analysis here again we have an unobserved error as a substitute for an intentional concealment or repression from these errors which originate from repression we must sharply distinguish those which are based on actual ignorance thus for example it was ignorance when on my excursion to wakau i believed that i had passed the resting-place of the revolutionary leader fischoff only the name is common to both places fischoff's emmersdorf is located in carntham but i did not know any better here is another embarrassing but instructive error an example of temporary ignorance if you like one day a patient reminded me to give him the two books on venice which i had promised him as he wished to use them in planning his easter tour i answered that i had them ready and went into the library to fetch them though the truth of the matter was that i had forgotten to look them up since i did not quite approve of my patient's journey looking upon it as an unnecessary interruption to the treatment and as a material loss to the physician thereupon i made a quick survey of the library for the books one was venedig ost kunstata and besides this i imagined i had an historic work of a similar order certainly there was de medicier the medicis i took them and brought them in to him then embarrassed i confessed my error of course i really knew that the medicis had nothing to do with venice but for a short time it did not appear to me at all incorrect now i was compelled to practice justice as i had so frequently interpreted my patient's symptomatic actions i could save my prestige only by being honest and admitting to him the secret motives of my averseness to his trip it may cause general astonishment to learn how much stronger is the impulse to tell the truth than is usually supposed perhaps it is a result of my occupation with psychoanalysis that i can scarcely lie any more as often as i attempt a distortion i succumb to an error or some other faulty act which betrays my dishonesty as was manifest in this and in the preceding examples of all faulty actions the mechanism of the error seems to be the most superficial that is the occurrence of the error invariably indicates that the mental activity concerned had to struggle with some disturbing influence although the nature of the error need not be determined by the quality of the disturbing idea which may have remained obscure it is not out of place to add that the same state of affairs may be assumed in many simple cases of lapses in speaking and writing every time we commit a lapse in speaking or writing we may conclude that through mental processes there has come a disturbance which is beyond our intention it may be conceded however that lapses in speaking and writing often follow the laws of similarity and convenience or the tendency to acceleration without allowing the disturbing element to leave a trace of its own character in the error resulting from the lapses in speaking or writing it is the responsiveness of the linguistic material which at first makes possible the determination of the error but it also limits the same in order not to confine myself exclusively to personal errors i will relate a few examples which could just as well have been ranged under lapses in speech or under erroneously carried out actions but as all these forms of faulty action have the same value they may as well be reported here a i forbade a patient to speak on the telephone to his lady-love with whom he himself was willing to break off all relations as each conversation only renewed the struggling against it he was to write her his final decision although there were some difficulties in the way of delivering the letter to her he visited me at one o'clock to tell me that he had found a way of avoiding these difficulties and among other things he asked me whether he might refer to me in my professional capacity 
at two o'clock while he was engaged in composing the letter of refusal he interrupted himself suddenly and said to his mother well i have forgotten to ask the professor whether i may use his name in the letter he hurried to the telephone got the connection and asked the question may i speak to the professor after his dinner in answer he got an astonished adolf have you gone crazy the answering voice was the very voice which at my command he had listened to for the last time he had simply made a mistake and in place of the physician's number had called up that of his beloved b during a summer vacation a school-teacher a poor but excellent young man courted the daughter of a summer resident until the girl fell passionately in love with him and even prevailed upon her family to countenance the matrimonial alliance in spite of the difference in position and race one day however the teacher wrote his brother a letter in which he said pretty the lass is not at all but she is very amiable and so far so good but whether i can make up my mind to marry a jewess i cannot yet tell this letter got into the hands of the fiance who put an end to the engagement while at the same time his brother was wondering at the protestations of love directed to him my informer assured me that this was really an error and not a cunning trick i am familiar with another case in which a woman who was dissatisfied with her old physician and still did not openly wish to discharge him accomplished this purpose through the interchange of letters here at least i can assert confidently that it was an error and not conscious cunning that made use of this familiar comedy motive c brill tells of a woman who inquiring about a mutual friend erroneously called her by her maiden name her attention having been directed to this error she had to admit that she disliked her friend's husband and had never been satisfied with her marriage mater relates a good example of how a reluctantly repressed wish can be satisfied by means of an error a colleague wanted to enjoy his day of leave of absence absolutely undisturbed but he also felt that he ought to go to lucerne to pay a call which he did not anticipate with any pleasure after long reflection however he concluded to go for pastime on the train he read the daily newspapers he journeyed from zurich to arth goldau where he changed trains for lucerne all the time engrossed in reading presently the conductor informed him that he was on the wrong train that is he had got into the one which was returning from goldau to zurich whereas his ticket was for lucerne a very similar trick was played by me quite recently i had promised my oldest brother to pay him a long due visit at a seashore in england as the time was short i felt obliged to travel by the shortest route and without interruption i begged for a day's sojourn in holland but he thought i could stop there on my return home accordingly i journeyed from munich through cologne to rotterdam hook of holland where i was to take the steamer at midnight to harwick in cologne i had to change cars i left my train to go into the rotterdam express but it was not to be found i asked various railway employees was sent from one platform to another got into an exaggerated state of despair and could easily reckon that during this fruitless search i had probably missed my connection after this was corroborated i pondered whether or not i should spend the night in cologne this was favored by a feeling of piety for according to an old family tradition my ancestors were once expelled from this city during a persecution of the jews but eventually i came to another decision i took a later train to rotterdam where i arrived late at night and was thus compelled to spend a day in holland this brought me the fulfilment of a long fostered wish the sight of the beautiful rembrandt paintings at the hague and in the royal museum at amsterdam not before the next forenoon while collecting my impressions during the railway journey in england did i definitely remember that only a few steps from the place where i got off at the railroad station in cologne indeed on the same platform i had seen a large sign rotterdam book of holland there stood the train in which i should have continued my journey if one does not wish to assume that contrary to my brother's orders i had really resolved to admire the rembrandt pictures on my way to him then the fact that despite clear directions i hurried away and looked for another train must be designated as an incomprehensible blinding 
everything else my well-acted perplexity the emergence of the pious intention to spend the night in cologne was only a contrivance to hide my resolution until it had been fully accomplished one may possibly be disinclined to consider the class of errors which i have here explained as very numerous or particularly significant but i leave it to your consideration whether there is no ground for extending the same points of view also to the more important errors of judgment as evinced by people in life and science only for the most select and most balanced minds does it seem possible to guard the perceived picture of external reality against the distortion to which it is otherwise subjected in its transit through the psychic individuality of the one perceiving it End of chapter 10